Hello and welcome to the York Festival of Ideas and this event, An Underground Guide to Sewers. Uh, I'm Colin Philpott, I'm hosting this event. I'm the author of uh, three historical non-fiction books, former BBC programme maker, and I'm a member of the court of the University of York. Uh, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this event and hope that you find the next hour um, informative uh, and interesting. Now, I imagine that most of you will be familiar with the phrase, it's a dirty job, but someone has to do it. Well, I think that could be applied to the book that is the subject of this event. The dirty job being the task of writing about sewers, the person doing it in this case, Stephen Halliday. Um, an underground guide to sewers, with its excellent subtitle, by the way, down, through and out in Paris, London, New York, etc., is what it says on the tin, a book about sewers, sewerage and all that goes with it. It's the story of how we humans get rid of our waste and how that has changed over the centuries. Um, it's actually quite a whimsical and in places amusing book, but also a serious one, because although toilets and all of that can sometimes be a matter of fun, the whole subject is, of course, deadly serious. Uh, Stephen Halliday is a specialist in industrial history, the author of a number of books, including Water, A Turbulent History, Amazing and Extraordinary London Underground Facts, and The Great Stink, Sir Joseph Bazalgette and the Cleansing of the Victorian Metropolis. Uh, Stephen regularly lectures at the University of Cambridge and presented with Michael Burke the TV programme What the Victorians did for us. Stephen, welcome to the York Festival Ideas. The floor is yours um, to give us an underground guide to the sewers. This is Sir Joseph Basil Jett, who may be regarded as the ancestor of all sewage engineers. He built more of London than anyone else before or since, most, most, much of it, of course, invisible in his capacity as chief engineer of the Metropolitan Board of Works. And he took office in 1856. Before the Metropolitan Board of Works was established, London was in fact run by a series of parishes, each of which wanted to dump its sewage and other rubbish to the next people downstream. His job was to create a metropolitan system of intersecting sewers that collected all London's waste and took it out to treatment works uh, on the Thames estuary. He became chief engineer to the Metropolitan Board of Works following an application in which he had to give three referees. One of them was a man called Cubitt, who at the time was the president of the Institution of Civil Engineers. The second referee was Robert Stevenson, who with his father designed the rocket locomotive. And his third referee was Isambard Kingdom Brunel, whom you've probably heard of. And I always feel that's rather like applying for a job as a parish priest and giving as your referees, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. So he got the job. But I first of all want to tell you about the problem that he was faced with. This is a letter that appeared in the Times on the 8th of July, 1855, and described the then condition of the Thames as being an opaque, pale brown fluid, fl fluid because the sewage of two and a half million people was flowing into the River Thames. And the Thames, of course, is a tidal river, so it never went away. It would go some distance downstream, while that was happening, more sewage was being added to it. it. The tide would then come in again, bringing it back into London. And so consequently, the River Thames was in effect London's sewer, with consequences which you can perhaps imagine. Now, this letter was signed by Michael Faraday, who at the time was probably the most famous uh, scientist in the world. Can we move on and just look at the consequences of this? This is a cartoon from Punch in the days that followed, describing Dr. Faraday presenting his card to Father Thames. And you can see what a dirty fellow he is, dead bodies and goodness knows what 
floating past in the river. And this was the other consequence, polluted water courses and wells, which spread cholera. There were four epidemics of cholera in London in the middle of the 19th century, which be between them accounted for almost 40,000 deaths. You'll see that the 1866 epidemic only affected a very small area of London because by that time, the rest of London had Bazalgette's sewers in place. In 1892, there was an epidemic in Hamburg. The government set up a commission to deal with the forthcoming London epidemic because cholera was traditionally imported from the continent and there were no deaths. This was the year after the death of Sir Joseph Bazalgette, who bequeathed to London a system that effectively pre uh, protected its citizens against cholera. Many people at that time, including Florence Nightingale and Edwin Chedwick, believed that the cholera was transmitted through the air. Now, we now know that that wasn't the case, and in fact, it was waterborne. Though, if you are walking around London in 1848 and there's a terrible smell coming from the River Thames and people are dying, and you then go home, and drink a glass of water in which you can see no germs without a microscope, it's perfectly reasonable to assume that the deaths are caused by the smell. Uh, Edwin Chadwick's proposal was to build a structure like the Eiffel Tower in the middle of London, by which, through some unspecified process, air would be drawn down from the upper atmosphere and circulated on the streets, thereby getting rid of cholera. That idea wasn't followed up. Uh, but instead, they adopted Basil Jett's remedy. This is an entry from Hansard on the 7th of June, 1858, three years after Faraday's letter. Honourable gentlemen sitting in the committee rooms and in the library were utterly unable to remain there in consequence of the stench which arose from the river. This was christened by the press, notably the Times, the Great Stink of London. You can just see how bad it was. It's very hard for us to imagine this. I have visited several sewage works um, in connection with my researches, and there's not actually all that much smell because the sewage is treated as soon as it arrives. But of course, the sewage in the Thames was untreated, and it was... There was an awful lot of it. And the summer of 1858 was a dry summer, not much rainfall. And so you had something like concentrated sewage running through the middle of London. Now, this diagram shows the hidden rivers that run beneath London, the Fleet River arising on Hampstead Heath and joining the Thames in the vicinity of Blackfriars Station, the Westbourne, and many others. They're still all there, those rivers, but they now run beneath the pavements. And in the Middle Ages, the rivers were used for the process for which nature designed them, namely to convey rainwater to the river. One was not allowed to, collect, to connect sewers to these rivers, though sometimes this was done surreptitiously. <clears throat> if you needed to spend a penny, then you went to the basement of your house, you did what you had to do in a cesspool, and that would be emptied at intervals by people called night soil men, who would take the sewage out to nearby farms where you was used as an excellent fertilizer. And this arrangement continued perfectly satisfactory into the late 18th century. Sewage was also used, incidentally, as a source of gunpowder. It contains substances which can be used to make gunpowder. And so we may say that Sir Francis Drake, for example, drove off the Spanish Armada by splattering them with the contents of London sewers, and it obviously worked. Now, this arrangement, which was a very good example of recycling, collapsed in the 18th century for three reasons. 
First of all, London grew larger, so the fields moved further away. The night soilmen had further to go with their cargoes. Secondly, in the 1840s, an alternative form of fertilizer became available in the form of guano, bird droppings from islands off the coast of Chile. I don't know if any of you have ever visited the National Trust property, Tinsfield, in Somerset. That was built by the family that made its fortune from guano. But the real killer was the introduction of the water closet. It was first invented by a man called John Harrington in the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, but he only made two, one for himself, for his home near Bath, which no longer exists, and one for the Queen herself, for her palace in Richmond. And it disappeared from history until the late 18th century, when it was rediscovered by a man called Joseph Brammer. He realized that he could improve the design of the water closet and make it mass produced, cheaper and more effective. And so from the late 18th century onwards, water closets start to be installed in English homes, particularly in large cities like London. The real breakthrough came with the Great Exhibition of 1851, when a very enterprising man called George Jennings did a deal with the organizers of the, ex of the Great Exhibition. <clears throat> he said, I will install my water closets in the pavilions the, in the Crystal Palace, provided you let me charge a penny for their use. That's where we get the expression, spend a penny. So whereas by the early 19th century, the Thames was still a fairly clean river, by the late 1820s, 1830s, it is starting to fill up with sewage as a result of the invention of the water closet. Because the night soilmen had gone out of business, the, the sewers, the cesspools were not being emptied and permission was granted to people to start connecting their cesspools to the underground water courses, which then, of course, took it down to the river. People usually ask me about Thomas Crapper and where he came into this. The word crap with its present meaning is dates from medieval times. It's an old French word which just means refuse. Thomas Crapper made very good use of his name by opening a showroom in the King's Road in Chelsea and showing off his designs. But he didn't really contribute very much to the uh, technical development of the water closet. This is the River Fleet flowing beneath the streets of London. On the left, you have it near St Pancras Station in the late 18th century. On the right, you have it flowing as a sewer beneath the Farringdon Road. Here is the River Fleet joining the Thames. Beneath that bridge you can see. On the right is the present site of Blackfriars Station. And on the left of the river is the present site of Unilever House. This is the Knights Bridge where the River Westbourne, which rises on Hampstead Heath, surfaces on, in Hyde Park as the Serpentine, passes uh, through Knights Bridge. On the left, you can probably just see Harrods there. And on the, on the right, you can see Harvey Nichols. And it actually flows in a culvert above the trains in Slow Square, Sloan Square Station and enters the Thames in the vicinity of Westminster. So, whereas the River Thames has been fairly clean up until the early 19th century, by the 1840s, it's in a shocking condition, and that was brought uh, to a climax by the Great Stink. And this was Basil Jett's solution. You can see the River Thames there flowing through the city, the thick black line. The other marked black lines are the sy system of intercepting sewers, which Basil Jett designed, to collect sewage starting in the west of the city, taking it mostly by gravity down through 
a series of pumping stations to the outlets at Barking on the north bank of the River Thames and Crossness near Abbey Wood in the south. That was his proposal. But there then followed a lot of argument about who was to pay for it. <clears throat> this is Sir Benjamin Hall, who was the, in effect, the government's minister of works, the chief commissioner of works, and he had to approve the system. And he wasn't convinced that Bazalgette's system would carry the sewage far away enough from the centre of London to prevent it from flowing back on an incoming tide. So there then followed a lot of argument about whether it should be further extended and above all, who was going to pay for it. Members of Parliament for London argued that London sewers were an imperial matter and should be paid for by the entire empire. Members of Parliament from outside London naturally took a different view. And this argument went on for nearly three years. It was uh, punctuated by a series of really daft proposals. One came from an Irish solicitor who suggested that London sewage to, should be pumped to the top of Hampstead Heath, then largely uninhabited, and allowed to flow off in all directions. I cannot help feeling that the, um, the people who now live in Hampstead Heath, like Polly Toynbee and Bill Oddie and Melvin Bragg, probably would not now be living there if that scheme had been, had, had been approved. But it was the great stink that came to the rescue because in 1858, the stench of the river was so appalling in the vicinity of Parliament that Parliament passed a new act which removed Big Ben's, Sir Benjamin Hall's veto and basically said to Basil Jett, get on with it, we'll find the money, don't worry about that, but above all, do something. Bear in mind that these men thought they were being poisoned by the odour that was coming from the Thames. If they'd known that it wasn't the smell, but it was the water that bothered, bothered, bothered them, we'd probably still be arguing about it. Right, so in 1859, work began in Victoria Park in Hackney, in April 1865, the Southern Treatment Works was opened by the Prince of Wales. That's at Crossness near Abbey Wood, still operating today. In 1866, the following year, we had the Whitechapel cholera epidemic in the only part of London that was still not served by Bazalgette system. In July, July 1868, the Northern Treatment Works, Abbey Mills, was opened. And then in 1892, we had the, coral, the uh, cholera uh, uh, epidemic that didn't happen, that didn't come to London because the system was now protecting the, the population. This will give you some idea of the sheer size of the operation. 82 miles of those big black lines, 165 miles of reconstructed sewers, 1,100 miles of new street sewers, that's John O'Groats to Land's End and some distance back again. Four pumping stations, because although the sewage flows by gravity, there, the gravity is not sufficient to enable gravity alone to take the sewage from west of London out to the new pumping, out to the treatment works, hence the need for four pumping stations. 318 million bricks were used in building them. That's enough, I'm told, by a friend of mine who is himself a bricklayer, to build enough houses to house the population of Portsmouth and cause an inflation in the price of bricks, 80,000 cubic yards of concrete and three and a half million cubic, cubic yards of earth were excavated. Those cubic yards of earth, incidentally, were used partly to build the, uh, the embankments, which will look out look after later, and partly to build uh, what later became the terraces of Stamford Bridge football ground, Chelsea football ground. This gives you some idea of the scale of the enterprise. 
Um, this is the railway that was built to enable Bazalgette to build the large outfall sewer, which has collected the contents of all the other sewers on the northern bank of the Thames from Abbey Mills pumping station to the Barking treatment works, a distance of some three miles. To do that, they had to cross a swamp, lower and raise roads and bridges. So they built um, a cement works at Barking. They then built a railway to carry the cement to the point where the sewer was being built. As the sewer progressed, the railway gradually receded until it got to Barking, until the whole sewer was constructed as far as Barking. And then the sewage, the, sorry, the cement works was dismantled and the railway and taken off for use elsewhere. That's just one small example of the work that was involved. This is Abbey Mills pumping station near West Ham. Uh, it was built um, in the monumental style that the Victorians traditionally built their great public buildings. Um, the two chimneys you can see that look rather like um, the, the uh, devices used by a mosque. And so the building was described as a Moorish extravagance. Those chimneys incidentally were abolished, sorry, were demolished during the Second World War because it was thought that the Luftwaffe was using them as a navigational device. Uh, at one point, people started to worry that an invading force, the French or the Germans or whoever we might be quarreling with at the time, could, could sail up the Thames, block up the sewage works and flood London with its own sewage. But a letter to the Times suggested that the sewage of London, north and south, suddenly advanced, suddenly released upon an advancing enemy fleet would cause panic and death by poisoning. So there you are. It was part of the defensive realm. This gives you some idea of the interior, this magnificent Victorian ironwork within Crossness pumping station. Um, uh, well worth a visit, incidentally, and um, they do have open days because Crossness has been restored by a team of, uh, of enthusiasts going back over 30 years now. And it will give you some idea of the magnificence of the wrought iron structures built in these stations. This is within one of the sewers nowadays. Bear in mind that London has what is known as a combined system. That is to say, it deals not only with waste from houses, but also with rainwater. Most modern developments have separate systems for, for collecting rainwater, which can be taken straight into rivers and waste, uh, washing machines, lavatories, baths and so on, which can be taken to treatment works. But the London system is a combined system because Bazalgette reckoned that building up, digging up London once, um, then the largest city in the world would be quite enough, and trying to dig it up twice with tw separate systems will be out of the question. <clears throat> now, these treatment works are still often referred to as sewage farms, going back to the time when the sewage was spread on fields as fertilizer. In fact, there are now very sophisticated scientific establishments using a mixture of physics, chemistry, and biology to separate the solids from the liquids and treat the solids with microbes whose idea of a good feed is what we send around the S bend when we use the lavatory. This is the modern cross nest treatment works. <clears throat> the sewage of London, this is on the South Bank, but a similar system is used on the North Bank and probably in the York treatment works as well. The sewage is put into, into settlement tanks where chemicals encourage the solids to move to the bottom. The liquid is then run off, oxygen is pumped into it, which stimulates the appetites of microbes who consume the half harmful pollutants 
And when it reaches a level at which the water is as clean as the river in the Thames, it is then released. The solids are pumped into these things, which look like huge accordions. They are then, it is then squeezed, producing more and more polluted liquid, which is similarly treated for longer with more microbes. And the remaining solids, which of course still contain a lot of liquid, are pumped to the next stage. These are incinerators, which burn the sewage and thereby generate energy, which is fed into the national grid. I should add that human waste contains a lot of methane, and you can heat it up to sufficient temperature, it, uh, it, it burns quite merrily. This leaves behind ash, which is of course sterile, and that is used to make breeze blocks. So next time you see some breeze blocks, just think where they have come from. This gives you some idea of the interest that was shown in Bazalgette's work, which were a, a, a matter of great public interest. I particularly like the observer one, the every penny spent is spent in a good cause. It was proposed that Bazalgette, who was paid 2000 pounds a year, incidentally, a lot of money in those days, should be uh, awarded a 6,000 pound bonus for the excellence of his work. Um, eventually the ratepayers decided that that wasn't such a good idea after all, but he did die a very wealthy man. He built the Victoria, Albert and Chelsea embankments, a lot of streets, bridges, parks, and he did work for other communities, including Cambridge where I live. It runs from Westminster Bridge to Blackfriars Bridge, and it reclaimed 37 acres from the Thames, replacing the sewage strewn mud banks with a major new thoroughfare, con which contains, which, beneath which is the low level sewer, the district and circle line, and a tunnel for gas, walker, water, and now electricity. It was opened on the 13th of July, 1870, not by Queen Victoria, who had one of her famous headaches and sent her son, the future uh, Edward VII, to do the job for her. That is a, this is an artist's impression of the embankment being built. On the right, you have the River Thames. On the left, you can see the district and circle line, which in those days was powered by steam. There's a steam train in the tunnel there. The bit in the middle, is the embankment road and to the right of the road you can see the low level sewer and the pipes. So it provided London with an alternative route from Westminster to the city, from Westminster Bridge to Blackfriars Bridge and it also provided um, these facilities including the low level sewers. This shows the work in progress in the back Ground there, you can see Waterloo Bridge. In, an or, in order to build the embankment, Basil Jet built a series of jetties and keys. They then pumped out the water from the square thus formed. They brought in materials, granite, cement, and bricks to build the embankment. They then dismantled the keys and the, um, and the jetties and moved them along to the next stage. In the background, you can see Somerset House, which was actually built in the River Thames. But by the time Basil Jet had finished, um, it was set well back from the river, as we'll see in a moment. There it is. This is the opening ceremony. The River Thames now on the right, Somerset House on the left, and the procession of dignitaries marking the opening of the embankment um, carried out by the future Edward VII. <clears throat> this is Victoria Embankment Gardens, again with the River Thames on the right, and on the left you can just see perhaps the water gate which stands at the bottom of one of the roads leading off the 
off the strand. That's the buildings on the left are in the strand. And in earlier times, that Watergate enabled the Duke of Buckingham to step onto his boat in what was then the River Thames and is now Victoria Embankment Gardens. So you can see that Bazalgette has moved the river about 100 metres further from the Strand than it was originally. The Strand, incidentally, is called the Strand because it used to be the Strand of the river, but no longer is, thanks to Basil Jett. And <clears throat> 1869, the Albert Embankment was opened to protect Lambeth from, fl from flooding, and it recovered nine acres from Lambeth, providing a site for Geoffrey Archer's penthouse and some other well-known landmarks, which I'll show you in a moment. That's one of them. Does anyone recognize that? It's the MI6 headquarters, James Bond's office, which uh, now sits on land reclaimed by Basil Jett. And here is St. Thomas Hill Hospital, again built on the Albert Embankment on land reclaimed by Basil Jett. In 1874, the Chelsea Embankment was opened, um, which in, again provides a road as well as a route for the low level sewer. And in that year, Basil Jett was knighted for his work in London. Now this gives you some idea of the costs. The main drainage cost 4.2 million pounds and the embankments cost 2.5 million. You have to multiply those figures by about a thousand to get an idea of what it would mean nowadays, i.e. 4.2 billion. His other works, Basil Jett's other works, which we'll look at in a moment, cost 14 million pounds, but that's mainly because he was concerned with building streets, which involved demolishing a lot of buildings and compensating their owners. In engineering terms, they were much more straightforward. Now, how did he do it? First of all, cut and cover. Dig a trench, build a sewer in it, cover it over. Where the sewers were more than 30 feet below the surface, they were in effect mined. And sometimes in order to, acque uh, to achieve a fall of at least two feet a mile, which you need to, to get a free flow of sewage. That's what he had to do. Basil Jett drew up the detailed plans, contracted, they were subcontracted, and the contractors ex executed them under very close supervision, for example, uh, on quality control of the materials uh, they were using. <clears throat> I mentioned earlier that the price of bricks increased. So Basil Jett decided to start to use um, Portland cement concrete, which wasn't very popular with, with engineers at that time uh, because it was, had, had a reputation for poor quality. He instituted a drastic quality control procedure when the Portland cement was delivered to his sites if it didn't come up to the necessary specification as a result of which the producers of Portland cement, who were based in the Medway Valley, the Medway River Medway area, instituted their own quality control procedures on site because they realized that providing dodgy Portland cement to Basil Jet was a lousy way to make a living. And that has now become the industry standard, Portland cement, which actually gets harder and more durable uh, when it's submerged in water. That ideal for creating sewers. <clears throat> These are the streets Basil Jet built. Northumberland Avenue was particularly expensive because he had to demolish the Duke of Northumberland's great palace that uh, would have um, faced what is now Trafalgar Square. By building Queen Victoria Street, from Blackfriars up to the Bank of England, uh, he enabled people to travel from Westminster along the Victoria Embankment, up Queen Victoria Street to the Bank of England, entirely on new roads built by Basil Jett. 40,000 people were rehoused 
as a result of the demolition work. And uh, this pr prompted Gladstone to in introduce the uh, the Cheap Trains Act, the, the which enabled people traveling out from suburbs, workmen traveling up from suburbs to commute uh, into London uh, at little cost. Tolls across the river bridges were abolished as a result of which there was a great deal of increased traffic and some of the back bridges started to collapse. So Putney Bridge was demolished and replaced. That's a, 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 a brick and stone bridge. Battersea Bridge, which is a metal bridge, was demolished and replaced. And Hammersmith Bridge was subsequently reconstructed. It was designed, of course, to carry horses and carts across the river for 120 years. It carried increasingly heavy levels of heavy, it's a, for 120 years, it carried increasingly heavy vehicles, including HGVs and double-decker buses. And it has now, after 120 years, been closed for renovation. It's perhaps worth mentioning that the nearby Hammersmith flyover lasted 30 years before it had to be closed for re renovation. <clears throat> we should be grateful to Victorian engineers for their caution. They were often using new techniques and as in the case of Portland cement, new substances. And so they tended to work out what they thought they needed, double it, add a bit for luck, and then start building, as a result of which their systems have been able to stand up to far heavier usage uh, than was anticipated at the time. This is the old Hammersmith Bridge, much narrower, as you can see, and you can see the toll gate there for horses and carts and also for pedestrians. It was a penny uh, for a pedestrian. Uh, I think it was threepence for a man on horseback and a shilling for a horse and cart before the tolls were removed. In 1878, Basil Jett suggested that a bridge was needed by the Tower of London because people couldn't cross the river uh, by road, except by going as far upstream as London Bridge. The City Corporation didn't think it was a good idea. St Olive's Parish on the southern bank, bank said, the bridge will have a prejudicial effect on the value of a large amount of property in the parish. They didn't want a lot of cockneys swimming across to Southwark and spoiling the view. But Basil Jett's proposal won the day, and if we move on, we can see the winning design. Well, sort of. That was the original design for the bridge, um, but it was decided that it had to look a little bit more Gothic um, in order to fit in with the surrounding medieval buildings. Uh, but that idea of a bascule bridge, which opened, was uh, eventually adopted. Ba Tower Bridge is actually quite a modern construction by the standards of the time. It's basically a steel and iron bridge with brick cladding uh, to make it look a little bit more in keeping with the surrounding buildings. But for its time, it was indeed a very, very modern construction. So why did no one write about it until 110 years after his death and I came along? I'd heard of him through a television program uh, and was uh, amazed to discover that no one had ever written about him. At the time, I was um, working as a lecturer in a business school in marketing. My background is in marketing. I worked in the food industry for many years where I uh, made my main contribution to human welfare by introducing Hellman's mayonnaise to Great Britain. But I then became a lecturer in a business school, uh, Buckinghamshire Business School, which following the abolition of the, the binary divide between polytechnics and universities in 1992, decided that the business school would like to become part of one of the new universities and that their chances of doing this would be greater if more people on the staff, like me, had doctor's degrees. So I said, I'll do a part-time PhD as long as I can do it on the subject of Sir Joseph Basil Jett. That was how I came to write the book. So why did no one write about him? Well, he left no personal papers at all. 
he was too busy. So the work had to involve going through uh, annual reports, parliamentary committees, newspapers, and so on, which I enjoyed. But I think the other reason is that so much of his work is invisible. Sewers are invisible. We don't think about them. Treatment works, even now, are in quite remote locations. You don't see roads as things that are built. You think of roads that happen when people build houses and shops and offices on either side. His roads, which we've seen uh, described earlier, had to be built by demolishing large quantities of building and more or less starting again. Embankments. The first time I gave this lecture, I was approached afterwards by a gentleman whom I knew to be a judge. And he said, you know, Stephen, I have chambers in the inner temple overlooking the Victoria embankment. And it had never occurred to me until today that someone had had to build it. It looks to me as if it's always been there, which is of course a tribute to the design. In fact, if you stand outside Shakespeare's Globe Theatre at low tide, look across at the huge granite walls of the Victoria embankment, you realize just what a massive engineering enterprise it is. He also created a lot of parks, but again, we tend to assume that they appear uh, of their own accord. But once the book was published, it became very, very popular. And shortly afterwards, I was stopped by one of my students in the corridor who said to me, have you written a book about London sewers? So I said, yes. So he said, um, it was on Blue Peter. So I said, well, what was it doing there? So he said, well, Blue Peter went down into the London sewers and someone read from this book to say what London was like before the sewers were built and then what it was like afterwards. And the book was written by Dr. Stephen Halliday, but I didn't think it could be you. So I said, why not? So he said, well, I didn't know you were a doctor. And anyway, I didn't think you were that clever. <clears throat> so there you are. That's a vote of thanks and appreciation from my, um, from my students. That was Basil Jett's obituary as it appeared in the Times the day after his death, which I think says more than I can about just why he is regarded by some, including me, and I hope now you, as such an important person in the history of London and many other communities, because London, uh, Basil Jett's methods were then copied in other cities like Cambridge and Norwich and York and elsewhere. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the London system is combined system, which deals with rainwater as well as sewage. Basil Jett always knew that at times of very, very heavy rain, such as we get, there would be times when it would be necessary to discharge sewage into the river. Since the solids tend to sink to the bottom, most of what was going into the river was reasonably clean water. But that problem has become greater over the years, and that has necessitated the building of the Thames Tideway Tunnel. Now, the flows of wastewater are e easy to predict. You know when people are going to be up and about, when they're going to be using the lavatory, when shops and offices and factories are going to be uh, in use. Rainwater, on the, whole, on the other hand, is impossible to predict and sometimes comes uh, very suddenly. The London system has 57 combined sewage overflows, which release the contents of the Thames, sorry, the contents of the sewers into the Thames at times of heavy rainfall. Now, Basil Jett estimated that this would occur 12 times a year. It's now happening 60 times a year. So why is that? He provided for a population of 4 million. At the time he was building, the population of London was 2.5 million, but he anticipated it getting, getting larger. The current population is 9 million. Now, if you have a field or a meadow 
or indeed a garden, a lawn, a cricket pitch, a football pitch, and rain falls onto it, it absorbs the rain slowly. Much of the rain falls on leaves and grass. Some of it will evaporate. Some of it will make its way slowly through the subsoil and be taken up by the roots of the plants. And the rest will make its way slowly into underground water courses. Every time you build a road or a courtyard or turn your lawn in your front garden into hard standing for your car, then the, the rain runs straight into the sewers. So hence you have a more frequent uh, occurrence of storms and the more volume of water flowing into the underground system without being taken up by plants or having a chance to overflow to uh, to evaporate it's estimated now that about 39 million tons of overflow from the sewers is dumped in the river thames every year nowhere near as bad as it was in the middle of the 19th century bad enough so now instead we have the Thames super sewer. It runs from 16 miles. <clears throat> it runs 16 miles from Acton in the west to Beckton beneath the river, beneath the River Thames, with a separate branch from Abbey Mills to Beckton, is 7.2 meters in diameter. That's twice the diameter of the underground tubes. It's 30 to 70 meters beneath the Thames, and it collects from the sewage overflows and with six pumps, lift, uh, with six pumps lifting the sewage uh, at the Beckton treatment works, uh, it ensures or will ensure when it's complete um, by 2023, that we're back in the, si in the, um, the situation that Basil Jet bequeathed to, the, uh, the, uh, the people of London with um, no uh, serious overflows each year. They actually began building this in November 2018. Parts of it between Abbey Mills and Beckton are already in use, but it's estimated that it will be uh, completed by 2023. And it will cost about 4.2 billion, which is in today's terms, about the same as it crossed Basil Jet. Okay, so there we go. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Stephen. Um, fascinating. I mean, a fascinating insight into literally what the Victorians did for us. Um, uh, and as you say, you know, so much of it, <clears throat> well, all of it really hidden under our feet, that in a sense, we don't think about it, but also touching on, you know, the, the, the current issues that we face, which, so we've, we've, we've a little time left and I have a few questions that people have submitted and some of my own. So I'll, I'll just right. fire them <clears throat> out if I may. Um, the first of which actually is, touches on what, what you've just been talking about. This is from Karen Waits, who asks, I believe that many of today's sewers were built in Victorian times. Of course they were. Are they still fit for purpose? I mean, you've talked about the super sewer, but what about the small local sewers? Do they need replacing still? You often hear about burst pipes, those are nearly always, in fact virtually always, water pipes, because, because water pipes are under pressure. If they weren't, your taps wouldn't work. So those are the ones that regularly have to be replaced. The sewers that Basil Jet built are still actually in very good condition. They're made of inert materials like brick and concrete, um, which in effect last forever, as long as they're looked after. Sometimes, I showed you um, the, 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 um, the slide of the man working in a sewer. Sometimes the bricks need to be repointed. The main problem occurs in the east end of London, around about Stratford, where the sewers are fairly close to the surface and where heavy goods vehicles running above them on the roads sometimes cause 
the, the sewers to be in danger of losing their shape, if I can put it that way, in which case they put in uh, steel structures to hold them in place. But generally speaking, the vast majority of the system, with that exception, is still virtually as good as the day it was built. Interesting. I mean, in the book, you also, of course, you don't just talk about London, you talk about, about um, um, sewers all around the world, particularly in other... Yes, countries. indeed. I, I was really fascinated by the story of Chicago, where they raised buildings to build... Oh, goodness, sewers. yes. That's, <clears throat> That's right. That's right. Chicago, they because it's very low-lying, uh, in parts below the level of L Lake Mich Michigan, they... Um, employed a device invented by a man called Pullman, more often associated with railway carriages, the same guy, who in effect jacked up the buildings around Lake Michigan to enable underground sewers and, and indeed an underground railway to be built. I imagine it was a pretty hair-raising uh, experience to watch this being done, but it worked. And that was in the early 20th century. I suppose if you look at th coming back to where we are today and you think about the sort of investment of billions of pounds, for example, in London. And, yeah, that's 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 fine, I suppose, in, in developed Western countries. But there are still pretty primitive um, uh, sewerage systems in other parts of the world today, aren't there? <clears throat> Well, yes, indeed. In, in parts of Nairobi, the sewage system consists of doing what you've got to do in a plastic bag and throwing it out of the window. Um, <clears throat> there are other methods being developed which operate on a much smaller scale for smaller and less well-off communities. Um, but some quite large cities still operate on what are basically sewage farms. The, um, the city of Indianapolis in the United States, for example, has what amounts to a very, sim very simple sewage treatment works. Um, I'm not sure what the population of Indianapolis is, but um, th that's how they manage. And you also talk in the book about the impact of climate change on how we manage our waste. Just briefly explain what the relationship is. Well, it's because we now get more torrential downpours than we used to. Um, the, I can remember when I was a child, a really heavy rainstorm was a cause of great excitement because it meant the ro road outside flooded and you could put your rubber dinghy on it. Now these events are far more common, not quite so much in this part of the world as elsewhere, but we do now get more heavy rain and turbulent rainstorms than we used to in the past. Donald Trump doesn't believe this is down to ch climate change. Virtually everyone else thinks that it does have something to do with it. It's just putting more pressure on the on the system, you mean? Because yes, it's just putting more pressure on systems which were designed to control uh, where, uh, floods and so on in more benign circumstances. Um, another question we had in, this was from um, uh, this was from Arthur Barnes. You hear about people flushing unwanted, unwanted pets down the toilet. Are the sewers a viable habitat for unwanted creatures besides rats? Um, no, they are definitely not. Um, you do find quite extraordinary things in sewers. I remember going to Abbey Mills and being told by the guy who uh, managed the sewage treatment works there that they had recently recovered a motorbike from the sewers. However it got down there, I cannot imagine. The great problem, of course, are these things called fatbergs, which are a mixture of fat discharged from kitchens and wet wipes, which do not dissolve in water. And, and sometimes they cause blockages in sewers and have to be uh, broken up by men going into the sewers with pneumatic drills. Now, Thames Water have tried very hard to persuade restaurateurs to adopt grease traps that stop grease passing from restaurants into the sewers, so far without success. There's a sewer that runs beneath Piccadilly 
in London, which is particularly susceptible to fatbergs because of the, of the number of restaurants in the area. Um, the London Museum actually has an exhibition with a large lump of fatberg. It's encased in glass, so it doesn't smell. <laughs> or if it does, you don't know it. Um, but the, the, the great problem for sewage treatment works is fatbergs. And the great problem, the cause of fatbergs is basically wet wipes. And, and a final question. I mean, the other thing you touch on in the books is that, of course, sewers have, people have had cause to go down sewers for reasons unconnected with their original purpose. I mean, for yes. example, uh, as a tour, sewers, uh, uh, as tourist destinations, I remember going on a tour of the sewers in Brighton years ago. Um, so people yeah. are interested in them and also <laughs> their role in literature and film and, of course, their role as, as a means of escape at various points in Indeed. history. Well, just oh, indeed, yes. Uh, um, you can go on a tour of the Paris sewers. Um, and in fact, in the uh, late 19th century, when they were first built, shortly after Basel Jet in London, they were very, very popular. Uh, they had special boats that floated down the sewers, but that was because they had separate systems for water and sewage. Um, in Warsaw, during the war, they were often used as an escape route and hiding place from the Nazis. Um, and there was also, I think, in Czechoslov in Prague, I think, as well. Uh, and of course, I'm sure most people would have seen the film The Third Man in, in, in um, Vienna, where uh, Harry Lyme tries to escape through the sewers. Yeah. But you can't do that in London. Visiting the London sewers is a more hazardous business because of the danger of sudden rainfall. So going down them is quite an elaborate process. You have to be accompanied. You have to wear special clothing. And goodness knows what. And of course, when um, Berlin was a split city, the, the sewers were used, weren't they, as a means of escape? They were indeed. That's right. When, when, when the uh, Berlin Wall was put up, some sewers but we're still used as a means of escaping to the West. Mm. Um, Stephen, we, I, sadly, we, I, I think, have run out of time. Um, thank you so much. It's been a fascinating insight into something which, as you said, you know, uh, most of the time, none of us think about that much, and it carries on literally beneath our feet. It's been fascinating. Um, just to let uh, everybody know that the recording of this event will be available on the festival's YouTube channel. Um, if you want to access it, go to the Watch Again section of the festival website. And if you'd like to um, purchase a copy of Stephen's book, it, it's a, it's, here it is, it's a great book and there's loads of pictures in it as well as some fascinating information. Um, it's called An Underground Guide to Sewers and it is available from um, our partner bookseller, Fox Lane Books. Uh, for more information on that, please see the festival website or you can go directly to foxlanebooks.co.uk slash festival of ideas. All that remains for me to do is to once again thank Stephen, but thank all of you um, for uh, your support of this event. Please do support uh, remaining events at the festival. Uh, stay safe. Uh, thank you for now. Goodbye.